here at Hudson Mohawk Industrial Gateway, the Bird and Iron Works Museum. I've been a Civil War buff since I was 10 years old, and that's almost 20 years ago. <clears throat> yes, that's, <laughs> that's today's joke. <clears throat> the American Civil War, of course, 1861 to 65. By 18, late 1862, early 1863, the war is not going well for the federal forces, the Union forces, if you will. Um, manpower has been getting very short. The initial surge of patriotism uh, has sent huge numbers of young uh, men to the army, but the uh, first two years of the war have been disastrous for the federal cause. Um, young men are being absolutely butchered and by late 62 and 63, manpower availability for the war effort is really getting short and the federal government is quite concerned about how they're going to maintain their manpower for the war effort. For the first time in American history, we come up with a military draft, a conscription act. Senator Wilson of Massachusetts proposes it in February of 1863. The House and Senate uh, endorse it. They pass it in early March of 63. President Lincoln signs it. The Conscription Act itself is rather unfair in the eyes of uh, most uh, working class He's talking people. Like um, the, <clears throat> uh, the act itself requires every uh, able-bodied man between 18 and 30 to register. Uh, in what was referred to as the first class from 30 to 45 uh, were the men who were married, 45 and above or those who may be physically uh, uh, incapable of serving were the third class. Uh, there were built into the act uh, two ways to get out of the, uh, the draft other than manifest physical disability, which was just about uh, the only way out. You could prove that you were a, a foreign alien uh, and that you were merely here temporarily, that could get you out. You could prove that your name was being included in a draft that was not where you were actually residing and the other was manifest physical disability. Um, but uh, be that as it may, uh, the two ways that you could get out, you could actually uh, provide, if your name was called in the draft, you could provide a substitute, someone that you had paid, and believe me, you had to pay somebody to do it, uh, to go in your place, they would uh, actually enlist and serve out your term and the other way you could get out was to pay the government $300 cash money and they would take your name out of the draft. Well, that doesn't sound like much today, but $300 was the average yearly salary for a skilled worker in 1862. So that's a lot of money. I mean, how many of you could cough up $75,000 right now to uh, get somebody out of the draft? <clears throat> uh, anyway, uh, the first few times I did this uh, lecture, the, the questions always tended at the tail end, always tended to be why was it that uh, everybody thought this was so grossly unfair? And so what I chose to do and what I am about to do for you is to work in a, a very quick uh, overview of a hypothetical Trojan, uh, Michael O'Reilly, 
Uh, he's actually a compendium of a number of people that I have studied over the years. I've uh, taken little bits and pieces and, and melded them into my hypothetical Michael. Uh, born in Sligo in the west of Ireland in 1830, he is the second son. Oops, where's my cursor? I got a, oops. I'm, I'm forgetting that I'm doing this as an illustrated image. He is the second son of a uh, tenant farm laborer and a domestic linen spinner who own a private one acre plot, which they use for a family garden. Their two combined wages coupled with the cash raised by the sale of occasional excess produce make them fairly well off by local standards. As the eldest brother, Mike, or Francis, would inherit the land, Michael was expected to seek the priesthood. But due to the potato blight of 1845, which had led to full-fledged famine by 1846, he is sent off to America at the cost of every penny the family could lay their hands on. Arriving on a coffin ship in Boston, he discovers that uh, anti-Catholic prejudice prevents gainful employment in anything other than real drudgery level jobs. At Christmas of 1849, a cousin visiting from Troy reports that jobs are quite plentiful here and arranges for Mike to get an apprenticeship as a molder's assistant down at Henry Burden's foundry in South Troy. His joy at this stroke of luck is tempered by the news from home that his da has died of typhus, disease being the real killer during the famine and his mother has been forced to sell the family land for pennies on the dollar in order to qualify for relief under the onerous terms of the poor laws that have been passed by the doubtful British Parliament. Seven years later, Michael completes his apprenticeship training uh, rising from $10 to $18 a month and he becomes a full-fledged molder at the incredible sum of $25 a month. This occurs just as the depression of 1857 hits. However, skilled workers suffer no reductions in wages that year, unlike unskilled labor, which takes it on the chin in that depression. When Mike sends his annual Christmas letter home to Ireland, he has always enclosed a couple of dollars. And this year to celebrate his great good fortune, he sends a $10 gold piece. The folks home think that surely he has become a veritable prince over there in America. Based on his own family history and the long Irish societal tradition of resistance to aristocratic oppression, he is actively engaged in local committee work for the Democratic Party. And he is one of the very first to join the brand new Iron Molders International Union Number no. Two soon after it is formed here in Troy in April of 1858. The main complaints are low wages, excessive apprentices, which dilutes the value of skilled labor, and forced release of the right to seek damages for injuries inflicted by management negligence. These grievances are compounded when the foundries announce a 10% reduction in skilled labor wages just before the 1858 winter shut down. In mid-March of 1859, the foundries look to open at that reduced wage 
and Iron Molders number two strikes 13 of the 17 Troy foundries. Three weeks out brings a settlement of status quo wages, wage parity between the foundries, and an agreement on union consultation on the number of apprentices. It is considered to be one of the first great victories in the organized American union movement. Reveling in these heady days of his newfound status and his political and unionized strength, and now being the traditional age, Mike sets his sights on obtaining a wife. And in May, uh, uh, March of 1859, at a social event hosted by the Hibernian Benevolent Society, he meets 28-year-old Margaret Mary Cavanaugh, a thread dresser at the Ogden Mills in Cohoes. Courting each Sunday for six months, they marry in September of 1859, and after Maggie quits her job at the mill, they move to a flat down near the Burden Foundry. When Mike sends home an early Christmas letter, the folks there are not just overjoyed at the news of his recent nuptials and the enclosed $5, but when he discloses that his flat actually has water that comes inside the house through pipes. They think that surely Mike has become a veritable god over there in America. April of 61, the war starts and many of the young molders rush off to join the army. Even though Mike has a real desire to help out his adopted land, which has been so very good to him, he feels he just can't leave Maggie and the baby. To his pleasant surprise, the labor shortage caused by those same patriotic volunteers pushes wages up and Mike is now getting $30 a month to keep him in place. The war inflation hasn't struck yet, so the money is very good. At Christmas of 1861, he buys the newly pregnant Maggie 10 yards of lace for her use in making curtains, which the neighbors all think is quite presumptuous of such a young man. They even begin to dream of buying their own house filled with factory made furniture because surely that is the epitome of the American dream. 1862, the war progresses and the news is almost completely bad. Casualty lists name a number of Mike's friends and acquaintances. Iron production increases drastically and the continuing labor shortage leads to even more wage increases, pushing Mike up to $35 a month but the war inflation has begun to ravage the real buying power of that money, cutting it by 25% or more of its pre-war value. Even at his skilled rates, money is getting very tight. And what with Maggie pregnant yet again, they are thinking that she may very well have to take in some collar and cuff piecework to help out. Christmas of 1862 is nowhere near as cheerful as was Christmas 61. And now in February of 63, the government passes an act that in effect says, Mike, we have decided that we need you personally for this great war effort and exchanging in exchange for forcing that service on you, we are willing to pay you the princely sum of $13 a month, one third of what you're making at home. And single or married, it matters not, there will be not one extra dime for Maggie and the wee Baines that you will leave back at home 
and that pittance will be payable every few months or whenever we feel like getting around to it, and from which we're going to deduct for worn out equipment, which we're kind of notorious for buying on the cheap, so count on having a lot of those expenses. In January of 1863, over 80% of the Army of the Potomac, the main federal army on the Eastern Theater, was waiting six months or more for pay. I mean, think about that. Oh, and by the way, Mike, as of January, we have officially changed the focus of the war. This fight isn't about saving the Federal Union anymore. Old Abe has figured out a great way of keeping those pesky Europeans out of our fight. Realizing that no nation that has freed its own slaves can support a slave owning entity in the face of a great moral crusade to abolish that evil, Lincoln has promulgated the Emancipation Proclamation, which took effect on January the 1st, 1863. So now, in effect, what we'd like you to do, Mike, is go down south and help free all of those fellows who are then free to come up here and take your job while you're off fighting. Now, listen, we don't want to be unreasonable about this. If this doesn't sound like something you're interested in, we'll be happy to let you get out. We'll even give you two options. You find us somebody who's willing to go in your place to substitute in, and you won't have to go. What's that you say? It turns out that that system is rife with fraud and crooked agents are charging up to $200 for substitutes who then flee without actually signing up in your place. Well, now whose problem is that? As the lawyers are so fond of saying, caveat emptor, Mike, let the buyer beware. If you prefer to avoid the trouble of that crooked substitution system, send us $300 cash and we'll take your name out of the drum and you won't hear any more from us. What's that you say? A full year's salary? Well, yeah, but whose problem is that? I mean, after all, your employer, Mr. Burden, paid for all of his boys to be exempted. So why shouldn't you do it? Surely you can't be thinking you're better off than Mr. Burden, can you? I mean, there's a reason everybody has taken to calling this the rich man's war and the poor man's fight. So the seeds are now sown for great dissension within the laboring classes and the actual institution of the draft in July of 1863 is the proverbial match in the powder keg. Friday, July 11th, 1863, New York City is the first major uh, metropolitan area to begin drawing names for the draft. I'm gonna pause for just a second because I'm not clicking. This is actually a marvelous uh, uh, piece that's in my personal collection. This is a, a draft broadside for the fifth uh, ward of the city of Troy, New York, um, uh, naming all of the men that the provost marshal recognizes um, as being draft age and draft eligible. This is basically up Congress Street, oops, and uh, uh, the beginning of Brunswick Road and Pauling Avenue. You should read this sometime up close and personal. It's like reading the Dublin phone book. Um, and, and I love the line right here, just above the Provost Marshal's uh, name. Uh, persons who may be cognizant of any other persons liable for military duty, please feel free to stop by my office and rat them out. Yeah, yeah, good citizen. Anyway, New York City on uh, Friday, July 11th actually begins drawing names. 
there are two or 300 people outside the provost marshal's office. They're not in a good mood, but there's no serious attempt made to change anything about the, um, uh, the draw. Uh, and in that evening, after the names are delivered to the local newspapers, in one of the greatest political ironies you're ever going to hear of, the names of the men who have been drafted are posted outside the newspaper offices. That's how they always let you know ahead of time that something was worth uh, your, your buying the paper tomorrow morning. Over here in this image, the um, uh, right-hand column is actually the sheet that contains the names of the men whose, uh, who, whose names were drawn for the draft that afternoon. The left-hand columns are the names that were taken from the casualty lists that had just arrived from the Battle of Gettysburg. Folks, you don't need a PhD to recognize the fact that the right-hand column is fresh meat and the left-hand columns are dead meat. Everybody and their brother recognizes exactly what this is. It's men who are heading to the charnel house. It is horrifyingly bad. All weekend, there is scattered violence all throughout Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens. Um, the New York City Police Department has less than 1,800 men, and they are definitely outnumbered over the weekend, even though the real violence hasn't started, but these guys are getting their clocks clean. Monday, July the 14th, the provost marshal returns to his office and believes that he is going to start drawing names again to complete the process. He is met by a crowd of over 3,000 angry people. Recognizing that his life is in danger, he grabs his staff and the draft uh, uh, boxes and flees out the back of the building. The crowd breaks in, sets fire to the provost marshal's office. That is the image you're looking at right here. The fire rages uncontrolled because of course the fire department can't get at the building. It burns down one square block of New York City. The crowd roars through especially Manhattan. The mayor's house is sacked. Um, the limit, uh, limited number of police officers that are available um, cannot control what's happening. There are less than 500 federal troops in the city. We'll get back to that in just a moment. The crowd begins wholesale looting of stores, restaurants, homes. Brooks Brothers, the famous um, uh, haberdasher, is completely uh, uh, sacked and looted. People are really angry at Brooks Brothers. Um, they had an early contract to provide woolen, virgin wool uniforms for the men. There wasn't enough virgin wool, so they switched to using recycled woolen cloth known as shoddy, and they produced the uniforms out of this um, very inferior shoddy wool. And of course, three months later, the troops writing home to their families about these GD shoddy uniforms give a whole new meaning uh, in the American lexicon to that word. But... Um, the uh, homes and, and restaurants, as I said, I mean, uh, Lexington Avenue, this is a wonderful image uh, out of the um, uh, uh, Harper's Weekly, um, uh, just down the street from the mayor of New York's home. I mean, this is what this is all about. The military troops 
in the city, less than 500 of them, because every able-bodied man has been pulled out of every metropolitan area in the North and sent to Pennsylvania to stop Robert E. Lee's invasion of that state, which of course culminates in the Battle of Gettysburg, July 1 through July 3rd of, of 63. General Wool of Troy, New York, has 500 troops. His headquarters are in the St. Nicholas Hotel. He's been in the army since 1812, 51 years. He's been serving as an active officer. He does what any thinking officer would do when confronted with overwhelming odds against you. He posts those 500 troops around the St. Nicholas Hotel and he waits for reinforcements. Well, that ends up getting him cashiered at the end of the week, but be that as it may. This is the general's house over at um, uh, Ferry and First Street in, in Troy. Ferry Street is the tunnel underneath. Today, it's a dormitory for the Russell Sage College known as the Wool House. But um, the city, <laughs> the short version is, goes to hell in a handbasket for eight solid days. I mean, it had started over the weekend. Monday is absolutely out of control. The, the rioters control the city of New York all through Monday, all through Tuesday. It really isn't until Wednesday that troops begin arriving in the city and begin to take control. Unfortunately, much of the anger is shown not against the authorities, but against the, the black population of New York. There are uh, uh, out, uh, incredible numbers of reports of lynchings, beatings, burnings, uh, shootings of the black population. They are fleeing because, of course, the working class has to have somebody that, that is the, um, uh, the cause of all of this difficulty. We're not going to look at the uh, upper crust, the, the businessmen. First of all, they've all fled the city. So it's the Blacks who bear the brunt of this. Um, I'll jump ahead just a touch. After this is all over, the New York City Police Commissioner comes out with a report that says there are 1,155 proven fatalities in the city during the draft riot. He is immediately called on the carpet by the mayor and he rescinds his report and says, well, no, I'm, I'm told it was actually about 150 people. Well, yeah, okay, who do you want to believe? Uh, to extrapolate that 1,155 to today's population of New York City, in eight days, the uh, uh, Manhattan would suffer somewhere around 9,000 casualties. I mean, this was absolutely horrifying. And as I said, the Blacks bear an awful lot of uh, the brunt of the anger. I mean, just look at this, we've lynched him, we're gonna burn him, we're gonna shoot him. <clears throat> Apparently there's no such thing as too dead. Uh, but the uh, one of the main uh, outrages against the black community is the assault on the Colored Orphans Asylum. Uh, this is uh, a major philanthropic uh, uh, enterprise in the city, largely paid for by the, uh, the Black community. The rioters assault the building. Uh, a group of um, uh, neighbors led by Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, formerly of Troy, New York, spirit the children out the back of the building as the rioters assault. They, uh, the rioters pause long enough to loot the building and the children, every single one of them manages to escape with their lives. Um, 
here's a, a headline. Uh, this is on uh, uh, Tuesday uh, for Wednesday's paper. Uh, more rioting, more Negroes hung, several soldiers killed and wounded. Uh, the reason I'm actually doing this, the second uh, headline from the bottom of this, citizen volunteers killed Colonel Jardine wounded. Colonel Jardine was a militia commander. He had brought his, uh, his troops uh, into one intersection. They opened fire on the crowd. The crowd melted away in front of them. Jardine says to his men, uh, wait here, I'm gonna go over here to the drugstore, the apothecary and pick up some things. And he walks up the street alone. <clears throat> The crowd catches him. They beat him quite literally to death. His wounds were mortal. <clears throat> yeah, I, I've got 60 guys with guns, but I'm going out alone. Oh, that, that's a good choice. <clears throat> anyway, uh, starting on Wednesday, as I mentioned, the troops begin to arrive. The federal government has been putting regiments on trains and sending them up to New York to quell the rioting. Um, the troops are absolutely shameless about firing into the crowds. Um, here's a, a great image. Uh, they're actually bringing artillery with them and they are opening on civilians with artillery pieces in New York. So, you know, 150 dead, I don't think so. 1155 sounds a lot more like it to me when you look at the contemporaneous pictures that we're looking at. By Friday, there's scattered violence, but the city declares that the riot has been ended on the eighth day. Um, as I said, there's some scattered violence through the weekend, but officially the, uh, the violence is over by that uh, second day. Um, not long afterwards, the New York City Council meets and votes a relief bill. They come up with a fund of two and a half million dollars to pay the commutation or um, uh, uh, substitution uh, fees for any man from New York City who is drafted and does not want to go. Now, uh, I'm gonna back up one step. The day that uh, New York explodes, it also explodes in Boston. There is an arsenal in downtown Boston that is beset by 1500 plus rioters. Major Cabot, who is inside with approximately 120 troops and two small cannons is going to hold the arsenal uh, until the doors begin to break. He orders one of the guns, actually both of the guns loaded with grape shot, a giant shotgun, an extremely powerful shotgun. They fire through the door they fire the second cannon, the troops rush out. Uh, their reports say they're stepping over bodies that are strewn all over the place. They chase the rioters away. They come back to the arsenal. There's one body left. All the others have been removed. Um, the one body is so mangled that the the rioters apparently didn't want to pick it up and take it with them. And so officially the death count in Boston is one, but it's a lot more than that. Um, there are also riots, I might add. This isn't just uh, you know three cities, uh, Akron, Ohio, Toledo, Ohio, Buffalo has uh, some difficulties. There's uh, about 18 or 20 cities in uh, the, the North that have draft riots all around the same time. Um, on Tuesday, July the 15th, word of course has already arrived from New York City about the difficulties that have started down there the day before. Um, 400 workers at Henry Burden's water powered plant 
up at Mill Street and Campbell's Avenue. This is the site of the famous Burden water wheel. Uh, 400 workers meet and decide that they are going to present a petition against the draft to the county political office holders. I mean, the right to petition for a redress of our grievances is a constitutional right. They uh, leave Henry's water powered plant. They march down Mill Street. They turn north along what is today Burden Avenue, the, the old Greenbush Road. Uh, they pass Erastus Corning's Albany Iron Works. They pass the Burden steam powered plant, gaining more and more strength. Many of the men coming out are, are joining them, carrying the um, uh, tools and equipment of their jobs to show that they are working class. They move past John Augustus Griswold's Rensselaer Iron Works up at the Post and Kill. They get all the way through downtown. They move up through the Collar and Cuff District uh, north of Hoosick Street. They rally at Mount Olympus up at today's North Street behind the Ale House, for those of you who know the area. Um, they rally there. Groups of uh, the men begin to break away and break into homes. A small group of them go down to St. Peter's Church, where they break in and they begin to ring the St. Peter's bell. Now, this is a Tuesday morning. What does a church bell pealing on a Tuesday morning mean? It's a fire bell. And so, of course, the neighborhoods are, are deeply upset. Everybody's concerned something big is happening. So the crowd marches back south down to the center of downtown. This is an image of the Troy City Artillery uh, Company parading on what was then known as Washington Square. You and I know it today as Monument Square. Um, Mon Washington Square, a uh, three-sided square. <clears throat> there are nine named squares in Troy. Every single one of them has three, three sides. And, and people wonder why I had to take geometry three times. <clears throat> anyway, um, uh, Washington Square, right in the center of it, the federal government had built the main recruiting depot for Rensselaer County a wood framed uh, uh, clappered building. That's where you would go to sign up for the army. The crowd begins chanting against the recruiting depot, but they are met by a contingent of um, uh, the upper crust, if you will, of society, including John Augustus Griswold, who is the employer of many of the men in this crowd. But most important, uh, in that contingent is Reverend Peter Havermans, the Dean of the Catholic community here in Troy. Um, he is, uh, I mean, the most widely known and respected Catholic priest in the city. Um, all of these men begin speaking to the rioters, urging calm, urging quiet, you know, go and present your petition. Well, a group of several hundred, estimated to be 300, give or take, break away from Washington Square and move a block south on River Street, where side by side are two of the most important newspapers of the day. Here in the um, uh, uh, tan colored uh, building is the Troy Daily uh, excuse me, the Troy Times. This is the official press organ of the local Republican Party and therefore is very pro-war in its outlook. Immediately next to it, the red colored building is the Troy Daily Whig, the unofficial press organ of the local Democratic Party and therefore rather anti-war in its outlook. 
the crowd breaks into the offices of the Troy Times and anything that is not nailed or bolted to the floors are carried out into the street or brought out the back of the building and thrown in the river, but everything in the street is set fire and there's a huge bonfire of the, um, uh, the goods of the Troy Times. The Daily Whig is largely expected to be assaulted, but nothing ever happens against it. Well, because, you know, tomorrow we got to read about what we did, and this is our newspaper. So the Whig is, is unmolested through the course of this. The crowd heads south on 2nd Street to what was then the county courthouse on the exact same spot as today's courthouse. Uh, Congress and 2nd Street. The sheriff has heard enough reports coming in about the mood of the crowd and he orders all the windows to be barred and all the doors to be chained shut. And he refuses to let any of the uh, politicos come out and meet with the crowd and take their petition. And this really, really angers the crowd. I mean, here they are exercising a constitutional right and the people that they want to address it to won't take their uh, petition. So they head further south on 2nd Street, they take a left on Liberty Street and they assault the Liberty Street Presbyterian Church. This is the preeminent black church in the city at the time. From its uh, institution in 1842 until 1849, its pastor was the Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, who saved the children at the Colored Orphans Asylum down in New York. Uh, he left Troy to go to New York. Um, this is actually uh, an offshoot of the First Presbyterian Church. Today, it's replaced by that gorgeous Greek uh, uh, revival temple at Congress and first across from the Troy Public Library. But if you look carefully, their little meeting house over on the side of the church proper was actually picked up and taken down to Liberty Street and turned into the Liberty Street Presbyterian Church. Uh, the crowd is very angry. I mean, this is the center of abolition and underground railroad activity uh, all through the 1840s, 50s, uh, 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 right up to the Civil War. And so the crowd is going to assail this church this is also a block south of Reverend Haverman's home parish, St. Mary's, now closed. But Haverman's and his assistant pastor, Father McDonough, who is said to be a very large and physically imposing man, get up on the steps of the Liberty Street Presbyterian Church and they are yelling at the crowd, no, 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 this is a house of God, you can't attack a house of God. Well, according to the Daily Whig account, one of the ringleaders turns to the crowd and says, to hell with these priests, we're going to burn this. And he jumps up on the stairs where Father McDonough hit him so hard he landed three rows back in the crowd whereupon it occurred to everyone that, oh, oh, that's a house of God. We should like leave this alone. So they head back over Liberty Street where they find the home of Martin Ingram Townsend, Troy's most prominent attorney of the um, uh, 1800s, former district attorney, former um, US attorney for the Northern District of New York. He will do three terms in Congress in the late 1870s and early 80s. The crowd breaks into his house. They loot the house. They push his piano through the bay window that you see there on the, the right-hand side of the first uh, floor. 
Um, Father Havermans gets over, gets up on the steps. No, 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 don't do this. You know, this is an outrage. You can't do this. Well, the crowd is moving in and out through the doors past him until all of a sudden the shout goes up. Somebody swiped Father's watch. His pocket watch with his gold chain hanging off of his cassock. Somebody in brushing past him grabbed the watch. Well, according to the accounts, everything calms down until the crowd can find the miscreant and they beat him almost to his death, according to the paper. They recover the watch, they give it back to father. This is just at the time when the local militia under Major Steenberg arrives with a small three pounder cannon. Steenberg says, you know, if you don't disperse, I'm gonna fire on you with this cannon. Um, the crowd begins to break up, but they don't really go anywhere. They walk around the corner and they head over to the county jail. This is exactly where the old county jail, now the family court building stands at Ferry and uh, Fifth Avenue. There are 88 prisoners inside this jail. Four of them are under indictment for murder. Four of them are black. The crowd breaks into the jail. The jailer realizing that the four Blacks are in mortal danger, actually takes them up to his private apartment in the attic of this building and has his wife hide them under the beds and under clothing so that they can't be found by the rioters. But 84 of the white prisoners are released Again, uh, uh, Griswold shows up, Father Haverman shows up, all these other politicians, no, 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 you've got to stop this. It's also now 5 p.m. I mean, some of these guys have been at this since 8 a.m. Rioting is, is thirsty work. They need to go have dinner, need to get something. Everything seems to be calming down until out of nowhere, a cry goes up in the crowd, down with the body houses. The red light district of that time isn't up next to the train station as, as some of you guys will recognize the main Fay era. It's down along Hill Street and um, uh, Liberty Street right in that area and the crowd surges from the jail south along Fifth Avenue past the breweries that are down there and they attack and loot three of the more notorious body houses clustered right in that area. By this time, most of the, the married men are all heading off home, but all through the rest of that night, there is scattered rioting. There are a number of arson fires, especially at the warehouses over along River Street that are broken into and sacked. Um, early the next morning, Mayor Van Alstyne, who has been missing from the city, arrives back very late that day. He issues a proclamation calling on all peaceably deposed citizens, disposed, excuse me, citizens to uh, uh, come down and register as militia to be used against the rioters. There are uh, widespread rumors that an assault is going to be made against the Water Valley Arsenal in order to obtain weapons. May, uh, Major Thornton, who is the commander of the arsenal at that time, picks 400 of his most trusted workers, arms them with muskets, and there are two artillery batteries at the arsenal that are outfitting. He has them roll their gun tubes out to the riverbank, aim at Troy, and surprise, there's no attempt made against the arsenal. Um, things are, are pretty rough through the rest of July and August. 
in September, the Troy City Council meets and they decide that in uh, it, it's good uh, political business, they will vote a uh, fund of $200,000 of taxpayer money to be used just as New York City did to pay the commutation or substitution fees of any man from Troy whose name is pulled in the draft. And it is known there's another draft call coming in September and Troy has been assigned 300 spots to be filled from the draft. So this is a wise choice on their part. You know, we're not gonna have anybody go who doesn't wanna go. We don't want them rioting in the street. There is one really interesting little tidbit as part of that $200,000 fund. Three businesses are chosen to have their damages paid from the fund. Is it the warehouses on River Street? Is it Martin Ingram Townsend's house? Is it the grocery stores that have been sacked and looted? No, it's the three body houses from Hill Street. Welcome to Troy. You know, got to keep the businesses going. <clears throat> yeah. Um, of all the people who have been arrested, all of the charges except for two are dropped for prudential reasons, as Mayor Van Alstyne calls it. Uh, the two who are convicted are uh, convicted of felony assaults for uh, uh, beating people. Uh, and I might add, this is Van Alstyne's uh, political death. Um, uh, the, the citizenry of Troy are quite uh, concerned about that. But uh, because of the fund paying for the commutation fees, not a single man from Troy who doesn't want to be drafted ends up being drafted. Uh, I will go off uh, on a tangent. We're going to jump ahead two years, April the 9th of 1865. The telegram bring, uh, uh, brings word that Robert E. Lee has surrendered to Ulysses Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, there are still Confederate armies in the field, but most everybody recognizes this is the death knell of the Confederacy. To all intents and purposes, the war is over. It's a Sunday morning when word reaches, people begin to gather in their neighborhoods. And as they are wont to do at that time, they begin to drift downtown. By the afternoon of that Sunday, it is estimated there were 10,000 people partying in downtown Troy. Uh, as dusk fell, they began to break into the local buildings, the local offices carrying out paper goods and furniture, and they piled it up around that wood frame recruiting depot in the center of Washington Square, and they burned it to the ground to show their great displeasure at what they had been forced to suffer for the four years of our civil war. But it also meant that when in 1888, the veterans of the civil war decided that they needed a suitable memorial to their service, the land was vacant and the city agreed to donate it to the organization for their use in erecting what you and I know as the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in the newly renamed Monument Square in the heart of downtown Troy, the location for much of the heated arguments during the draft riots of 1863. And I might add, while New York City had the most fatalities. To this day, the worst civil insurrection in American history, Troy is considered to have the second most destructive, on a property damage level, the second most destructive draft riot in the nation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my story of the draft riots of 1863.
Thank you, Michael. That was very interesting. If there are questions. Yes. If there's any questions, if you want to put them in the chat, I will share those with Michael and uh, we'll, we'll get your questions answered, hopefully. Well, thank you very much for the, the nice comments. Thank you, Pam, <laughs> Michelle, Vin. <laughs> yep. It says, is there a list of the monuments? I'm not sure what monuments. We do have, oh, oh, the, the, the squares. Um, actually, yes, I, I do have a list of the, uh, the squares. Uh, I don't have it with me. I'm home right now rather than uh, at the museum. But um, there's uh, Liberty Square at Liberty and 4th Street, um, uh, right uh, at the um, uh, kind of kitty corner from the marketplace. There's Columbus Square at Jacob and um, Fifth Avenue, um, uh, Washington Monument Square. Uh, Franklin Square, of course, no longer exists because uh, that was torn out for um, the other, um, um, uh, just north of the Green Island Bridge, um, Chatham Square, that was right off the bridge, that's five. I wasn't expecting a quiz. <laughs> well, here's um, another one for you, Michael. Do you have any idea of how many men from Troy did serve in the Civil War? Oh. Um, we've been working on that list for quite some time. Um, it, I, I feel extremely comfortable in saying we've got over 2000 names. And uh, at the time of the Civil War, our population was almost exactly what it is now, 50,000, give or take. Uh, if I remember it correctly, the 1860 federal census shows 46,000 in Troy. So we had 2,000 uh, plus men clearly from Troy alone. And, and there's a lot more than that who enlist in Troy, but they came down from Brunswick or Petersburg or wherever. But I mean, real Trojans, 2,000 plus. Um, and, and I might add, I'll go off on a quick tangent here. Um, you know, you look at the casualty counts of our current endless wars and you know we've got 3000 in iraq and and you know another 3000 whatever in afghanistan um the the casualty counts in uh the, the american civil war are astonishingly brutal um i, I do a, a civil war casualties tour in oakwood cemetery we have 88 men dead um, you know, this is, it, it's astronomical. Um, James McPherson, the Pulitzer Prize winner, makes a wonderful point in one of his books. Um, the, uh, in 1865, 2.17% of the population shown in the 1860 census are dead. 720,000 Americans in, in less than five years. To extrapolate that percentage to today's population, since the election that sent Donald Trump to the White House, we would have needed to suffer six and a half million dead and somewhere in the vicinity of 36 or 38 million walking wounded, most of whom are missing a limb. I mean, ponder that for just a second. This isn't, oh yeah, my daughter knew that young corporal from Glens Falls and my cousin is, uh, is friends with the family of Sergeant Fisher from Waterville. This is somebody on your street. I mean, for those of you who have kids or grandkids of military age, I mean, one of them that you know is dead. Uh, three of them are wounded. This is catastrophic. I don't know what, put me on that topic, but anyway. Here's one. Uh, am I right in remembering we went from the anti-rent riots to the anti-draft riots in a fairly short period of time? 
Well, actually, the anti-rent uh, riots actually uh, continued after the, the Civil War. Uh, some of the, the most vicious uh, element of the anti-rent war comes when the soldiers come back from the, uh, the Civil War and need employment, and Walter Church hires them as thugs and ruffians. Um, so the, the anti-rent war, I mean, a lot of people call it ended in 1869. The last fatality is 1882. Um, now I'm, I'm looking, uh, Pam, uh, what proportion of Civil War generals are buried in Oakwood? Well, I mean, we've got what I jokingly refer to as nine and a half, and there are uh, several hundred uh, Civil War generals. So my math skills aren't that good. It wasn't just geometry I sucked at. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we've got a number here. There's another, uh, if I remember correctly, eight in Albany Rural, a, a lot are from New York. Um, we haven't changed that much with our bigotry, have we? Oh, no, sir. No, the more things change, the more things stay the same. And that, that looks like it, that's it, Michael except for a lot of excellent comments about how wonderful the presentation was, which I concur. It was really interesting, Michael. We uh, I'm looking here at uh, the one comment about how important uh, uh, horseshoes, railroads, oh, right. uh, yes. nails, spikes, et cetera. Oh yes, um, uh, we're, we've got a project underway for the um, uh, Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area where uh, we're identifying all of the industries and businesses that uh, uh, contributed to the, uh, uh, the federal war effort. And when you see that list, it'll blow your socks off. Um, I mean, Burden producing 51 million horseshoes a year, the Arsenal producing small arms, ammunition, artillery uh, stuff, leather goods. They didn't make cannons at the time. Um, but um, uh, there's a place down just outside New York City that got a contract to provide 40,000 ostrich plumes for cavalry units. Because we all know you can't have a war without ostrich plumes. <laughs> um, oh, oh uh, wait a minute, that goes back to the more things change. Yes, yes, your federal government just loves to figure away money. Oh, I'm on, I'm on my soapbox, sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay. That was it, Michael. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. You and, are all- uh, Keep watching our website because we'll have more. We're going to, I think we're going to have another presentation with Michael in May. We're, we're working on that. Um, thank you everybody for joining us and uh, stop into the library and say hello. Thank you. Have thank a nice you day. ever so much. Thank you, Michael. As You're always. Very Thank you. Very welcome, as always. Talk soon. Do you, do you have an idea of how many? There wow. were 43. Oh, I'm, I'm clicking on it. Whoa. Okay. Yes. You can fool some of the people all the time. That's right. Uh-oh, I better. I didn't stop recording. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Good night, everyone.